welcome to Delivering Miracles, a podcast to teach women like you tips and strategies on how you can have a safer pregnancy so you can bring home a healthy baby. I'm your host and your high-risk pregnancy expert, Parijat Deshpande. I can't wait to chat with you. Recently, there has been so much more talk about pregnancy loss and miscarriage and what it's like to lose a baby due to miscarriage and what it's like physically, what it's like emotionally, what it's like to heal from that. But as somebody who's never experienced a miscarriage, it's important to me to really hit home and share that miscarriage is only one type of pregnancy loss. Today, I want to share with you about a different type of loss that we don't talk about as much, but happens to a lot of women and is actually dangerous. And that is an ectopic pregnancy. And I want to talk about it because I went through that myself. And as somebody who's gone through an ectopic pregnancy, it's really important for me to distinguish the two because there are very different, distinct factors that make the experience of a miscarriage and an ectopic pregnancy very different. It makes the experience different. It makes the healing process different. And if you heard episode 54, you know how much I really value the importance of how we talk about our experiences. And so I never really like it when people group ectopic pregnancy under miscarriage because in my mind, I think it's very, very different. So before we jump in and I share a little bit about my experience, what is an ectopic pregnancy? Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. An ectopic pregnancy is when a fertilized embryo implants somewhere outside of the uterus. So here's what typically happens, a really quick anatomy lesson, right? So you have your ovary. It ovulates an egg. The sperm comes up through the uterus, up through the fallopian tube, and fertilizes the egg. And once it's fertilized, the embryo travels down the fallopian tube into the uterus where your endometrial lining, right? That's the lining that you're growing throughout your cycle that you shed as a period if you don't get pregnant. That lining is there to welcome a fertilized embryo. And in most cases, that embryo finds a nice little spot in your uterus in that comfy, cozy, cushy lining that you've been developing. It implants there. That's when you get your positive pregnancy test. And it from there grows and grows and grows until you deliver the baby. In the case of an ectopic pregnancy, the sperm meets the egg in the fallopian tube and then somewhere the 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 feet the embryo goes somewhere else most of the time with an ectopic pregnancy the the embryo implants in the fallopian tube rarely but it does happen the embryo can implant somewhere else it can implant in the wall of the uterus i have a friend who experience that. Sometimes it can implant in the ovary itself or somewhere else entirely. But essentially, an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is implanted somewhere where it should not have implanted. And the problem there is that wherever it implants, unless it's in the uterus, it's not designed to grow a pregnancy there. And so it can have really dangerous consequences, which I'll tell you about through my story in just a little bit. Typically, you hear that ectopic pregnancies occur in about 1% to 2% of pregnancies, which is less common than a miscarriage. Miscarriage happens in one in f- to 1 in 4 women. This is only 1% to 2% of pregnancies. But research has shown that approximately 9% of all pregnancy-related deaths occur because of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So this is really scary. The good news is that about a third of women who've had an ectopic pregnancy will go on to have a normal pregnancy later, which is great. And, but you are at risk. You are at risk of having another one. So you are going to be 
monitored more carefully the second time around, just in case, if you've had one in the past. Now, statistics aside, I can tell you really personally that an ectopic pregnancy is really scary. And it's not something that we talk enough about. And so that's why I want to share with you my experience today so that you're prepared in case it happens to you or it happens to somebody else that you know you have the tools available to you to know what to do about it. Because if there's anything that I've learned from my experience with an ectopic pregnancy, it's that you don't need to know what's happening to your body, but you do need to speak up when something feels wrong to tell someone, especially your doctor, that something feels wrong. They'll help you figure out what the problem is, but you have to speak up when something feels wrong. We had to jump into our fertility journey sooner than we had wanted because I had found out that because of my severe endometriosis, if we don't have children quickly, our ability to have children, that window would close very early. And it was a really jarring thing to hear when I was in my 20s. You know, you hear about all these people that have children and they're 40s and now sometimes 50s. I thought I had time. I knew that there would be trouble, but I didn't think it was so close to the end. And because of that diagnosis, we didn't have the luxury of waiting until we wanted to start trying. And we didn't really have the luxury of trying on our own. We knew that we would need help. And so we jumped into fertility treatment right away. We weren't one of those couples that tried on our own for years and years without success and then reached out to a fertility specialist. We had to go there right away. And once we did all the testing and all the, you know, figuring out of what else is going on and do we have any other problems that we're going to run into, we decided to jump into an IUI, intrauterine insemination, which is a procedure that Basically, it's called artificial insemination. You might have heard of that, right? It's when you take a sperm sample and they use a catheter and they inject it into the uterus instead of into the vagina, giving it more chance of more sperm making it all the way up to the egg, increasing your chances of getting pregnant a little bit, hopefully. What I had said to my husband, I think it was a couple days before the IUI day, it was in December when we were scheduled to do it. And I told him, you know, I did my research, right? I knew fertility treatment is not a guarantee. I knew with the endometriosis diagnosis that it's not a guarantee that this could take a while. And and I think we went into it pretty realistic about, hey, this cycle may not work and that's okay. We're okay with that. We'll just keep trying. And I remember telling my husband, we were standing in the kitchen. It was just a couple days before the procedure. I was already taking my injections to help my ovaries ovulate and all of that. Uh, I was feeling pretty hormonal. Not as bad as I thought I'd be feeling, but, you know, not quite myself either. And I remember telling him, I hope it's either a positive or a negative. I'm not going to be able to handle if it's anything in between. And he's like, what do you mean by that? And I said, I'm not going to be able to handle it if we lose a baby. So I hope it's either positive and then it just works and we got really, really lucky or it's just a negative and it didn't work and we can just try again. I don't know what made me say that. It's a really random thing to think, but it's the thing that was on my mind. And I just kind of blurted it out that day. So we went to the procedure. We did the procedure. Everything went smoothly. And the timing of it worked out that we were going to find out the results right before Christmas horrible timing, let's just say. Okay, so it's December 23rd. 
that morning we woke up, we were both really, really nervous. I was so good about not testing before that date. I was so like, not going to do it. I don't want to know. I'm going to wait till that day. And those two weeks, that wait was excruciating. But I really held to that. That morning, I, I, um, I came out, I went to the bathroom, I took the test and I left in the bathroom and we were just, we were so nervous. We were so nervous, um, trying to like keep ourselves distracted while we waited for the three minutes to end um, and trying to guess what it might be, but then also not wanting to talk about it. You could feel the anxiety in the air. And then I went into the bathroom. I looked at the test. And I looked at it and I looked at it and I kind of twisted it and turned it. And I was like, I think it's positive. And my husband was not like, what what are you talking about? I was expecting like a certain answer. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, it's worked. That was not what happened. We had a big fat maybe as a pregnancy test. Because if you held it up to the light and held it in a certain direction in natural light by the window, you could see a very faint line. So was I pregnant? Was I losing the baby? Was there a baby? I don't know. And this was my very first pregnancy test. I don't, this is the first time we had done this. I didn't know. And our hearts had been racing. And now we were kind of in this suspended, like, I don't really know what to do with this. Do I feel relieved? Do I feel sad? Do I feel hopeful? What is it? Called the nurse. She asked me to come in and do blood work. She didn't sound very positive. And she was one of the nurses who was so sweet and so cheery and just so, like, so positive any other time. And I could tell very clearly that the way she was talking is very different. So I told my husband, you need to brace yourself for this. This is probably a miscarriage. And we'd kind of known that that was a possibility. So it wasn't that shocking, but we just, we were in the suspended reality almost of what does this mean and what do we do with it? So I did the blood test. Doctor called later that day and he said my HCG level, which is the pregnancy hormone, was 21. Technically, I was pregnant, but the number was not very strong. And it wasn't a great start. That said, what mattered more was whether the number would double in 48 hours. So he asked me to come back and do a blood test again in two days. And that began the most excruciating three weeks of my life. Over the holidays, over, thank goodness my husband had a week off between Christmas and New Year. So he's at least home with me. And every two days I was going to see, I was going to the lab to see what my levels were. And every two days the levels would rise, but they would not double. Was it a pregnancy? Was I going to miscarry? Was it, what was it? What was going on? The tension that we felt was palpable because we didn't know what to expect. After several blood tests, they were preparing us that, hey, this is likely a pregnancy that's not going to last. The numbers are just not rising properly. You're going to lose this baby. So every day, every single time I went to the bathroom, I was preparing myself for a miscarriage, that I was going to see blood that I was going to have the most heartbreaking experience of watching my body lose this pregnancy. We were glued to our phones because I was going to the lab so often that the doctor was calling constantly with blood test results and what it might mean. And every time the doctor called, I would say, what can we expect? What's going on? And he had no idea. It was so hard to know. It wasn't good, but we weren't even allowed to grieve whatever it was that wasn't good because we didn't know what it was. My levels were rising so slowly. 
we knew that I was pregnant. There was a there was an embryo somewhere that was growing and trying to become a baby. But for some reason, it just wasn't growing fast enough or it wasn't strong enough. It just, it wasn't looking good. And yet the loss of a pregnancy wasn't what stuck with me at the time. Over the week that my husband was home, we tried our very best to distract ourselves. We'd go to the movies. We actually went, I remember we went to see Sherlock Holmes. We're total Sherlock Holmes fans. We went to see the new movie and it was such a good movie. I realized later because I had to see it a second time because the first time we couldn't concentrate on it because in the middle, the doctor called again with more news. We don't know. The levels rose again. We don't know what that means. Is this a baby I get to keep to come home or not? I don't know. Do I get attached to this baby or not? I don't know. And the stress of what's going to happen. When am I going to see the blood that everybody talks about with a miscarriage? When am I going to see that horrible scene? When can I prepare myself for that? When's that going to happen? I don't know. We weren't in the mood to do anything for New Year's that year. Because by that point, we knew we were going to lose this baby. We knew that we had done our first round of fertility treatment. I had gotten pregnant, but there was something very wrong. The miscarriage was imminent. And I remember talking to my husband a couple days before New Year's when we were deciding, do we want to go out? Do we not? We had friends who were coming and visiting from out of town who we usually spend New Year's with. And I said, I just don't have the energy to pretend like everything's fine. I'm carrying a baby that I'm not going to be able to bring home. I could miscarry at any moment. I don't want to be out somewhere when it happens. My heart was broken. But I couldn't feel it. It was this really bizarre situation of... I couldn't let myself feel that broken heart until I knew what was going on. So we went out to dinner. We tried our best to be as present as possible. And then we just came home, changed into our pajamas, watched a movie, and went to sleep. We couldn't believe we're ringing in the new year expecting our very first loss. And then I got angry. I was like, I knew I couldn't handle this. Why is this happening? I stated this before our IUI. I put it out there. I said, please don't let this be a loss. I can't handle a loss. I can handle a negative pregnancy test. I can't handle a loss. And yet here we were, just waiting for it to happen and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, still doing blood tests every two days. For three weeks, I did them for every two days. And every time I went, the numbers would rise. Just not enough to make anybody feel comfortable that this pregnancy was going to last. Finally, at the beginning of Ju January, a few days after New Year's, my doctor sat us down and he said, I think this is what we call a missed miscarriage. My guess is the baby has stopped growing and your body doesn't know that yet. So it's still producing the HCG, which is the pregnancy hormone. But I don't think your body knows that the baby's gone pregnancy's gone. You've already miscarried. So he suggested we do what's called a manual vacuum aspiration, which is an in-office version of a DNC, which is they take a small little vacuum and they empty out the contents 
of the uterus, to put it as clinically as possible. He told us that that was, an, that was one option. And he recommended it because he was worried that it could be ectopic. The, the HCG levels weren't so high that, it, that he felt it could be. But this was the best way to find out. So the plan was to do the MVA and do a repeat blood work. And if it was a missed miscarriage, my HCG levels would have dropped. So we went in and we did the MVA. And that's when my heart broke. I could feel my uterus contracting. I could feel the machine doing its job. It wasn't very painful. I didn't need any medication for it. It was done in the office, so it wasn't a big procedure or anything. But I lay there and I just sobbed. I thought we had just lost our baby. And what a horrible, horrible thing to feel. And to know that I had to do this procedure to make it happen. The room was really somber, really quiet. My husband held my hand. Doctor patted him on the shoulder, squeezed my hand, and left us in the room. Just the two of us and this giant hole in our hearts. He thought we could finally breathe because it was over. I took the next day off from work, even though I didn't have to. You know, physically I was fine. I just knew I needed, I needed the day. I went in the morning to take my blood test. We had done an HCG level right before the MVA to get a baseline, and I was going to go again. And the expectation was that the levels would have dropped. Did the blood test. Felt pretty good about it. You know, I wasn't really contracting very much or um, cramping very much. And physically, I was actually feeling a lot better than I thought I would. I thought this would have a much longer impact, and it really didn't. I was leaving the lab and walked into the lobby right in front of the information desk, and I felt this really sharp pain that made me stop in my tracks. And he took my breath away. I was there for a good, I don't know, it felt like a minute. It was probably just five, ten seconds. I thought, whoa, that's a, that's a tough, that's a, that was, a, it was really painful. That's, that really got my attention. But I assumed it was just a side effect of the procedure from the day before. Caught my breath, got my bearings straight, got in my car. I started feeling a little funny. I don't know how to describe it better than that. I felt funny. I wasn't woozy necessarily. I was not in any more pain. But I, I felt almost like, you know, when you have a, a camera that's not in focus, like it's almost in focus, but it's not quite sharp. That's how my head felt. Like I was there and I could drive myself home, which now looking back, I probably should not have done. But I wasn't quite there. There was something up. By the time I got home, I was feeling nauseous. I was feeling a little sick. I wasn't very hungry, even though it was lunchtime. And I didn't feel energized enough to be able to get up and make myself food. And my brother was just happened to be in the area. So I asked him if he could come by and bring over some food, which he did. And I took a few bites 
And all the while, I was just feeling worse and worse and worse. How do I describe it? Weaker? Fuzzier? Slower? My thinking was slower. I felt cloudy in my head. I felt like I had less energy. I wouldn't say that I was feeling sleepy, but I was definitely feeling more tired. Finally, about an hour after lunch or so, I thought, you know what? This does not feel right. Something does not feel right. So I called my doctor and he said, I was just about to call you. The results from your MVA came back. You know, the manual vacuum aspiration test, the, the thing that we had done, the procedure we had done the day before. They did not find any pregnancy tissue in the biopsy. And I think I actually stopped breathing because the next words out of his mouth were, it's an ectopic pregnancy. My heart had stopped. My breathing had stopped. I didn't know what to think. And he said to me, your levels, your HCG levels rose. So we know that it's ectopic. If we didn't already, now we have double confirmation. But the levels are so low, I've never seen it rupture at this level. They're so low. It's like a thousand HCG. My beta HCG level was a thousand. He's like, I've never seen it rupture at that level. It's almost the end of the day. So why don't you come in tomorrow morning and we'll give you what's called the methotrexate shot, which is, it's it's really, it's typically used in with cancer patients and it's used with women who have ectopic pregnancies at a much, much, much lower dose because it works to slow down the growth of rapidly growing cells which is what a pregnancy is, right? Cells are constantly growing. They're growing faster than any other cells in your body. This shot identifies what those cells are and stops it. That's the typical intervention for an ectopic pregnancy. I told him I don't feel good. I told him I described my symptoms. I'm feeling tired. Something just feels wrong. And he said, he again said, I don't think it'll rupture if it does go to the ER overnight, but I think we can wait till tomorrow. I've never seen it rupture this at this low of a level. At which point, you know, I hung up, I called my husband and I told him, I said, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And he said, you need to call him back and tell him because you've been right about your body so far. You knew something was wrong before. And even before I tried to get pregnant, I was always very good about what my body was going through. I didn't know what it was necessarily, but I always knew something was wrong when it was wrong. So he, I'm, which I'm so glad that he did because I called, I talked to his nurse. I said, this does not feel, I, something's wrong here. And so they said, well, we're closing, but if you can get here in 20 minutes, we can give you the shot today. Now, my husband works 20 minutes from home. Home is 20 minutes from the clinic. And I knew for a fact at this point, driving was a very, very bad idea. So my husband, I hope no police are listening, <laughs> drove like a maniac right at the beginning of rush hour to get home, picked me up, and we zoomed to the clinic as fast as we could. Got there a little bit late, but what can we do? By the time we had gotten there, I couldn't stand up without somebody holding me up. And I had this urge to just lie down and go to sleep. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew something was wrong and I knew we had to be there. It wasn't my usual nurse. It was somebody else. Most of the clinic had gone home. The clinic was really quiet because they weren't seeing patients anymore. And thankfully, I had a nurse 
who was very perceptive because she ran to get my doctor. And he walked in and said, she told me something was wrong. You didn't look right. And he looked up at me and he goes, I see why she said that. We need to get you into an ultrasound right now. Something's not right. You don't look the way you looked just 24 hours ago at the MVA procedure. I was weak. And as the minutes were ticking by, I couldn't even sit without support. I just kept wanting to slump over and just keep my eyes closed. Got into an ultrasound room, did the ultrasound, and within seconds, my doctor's face turned white. And he said, you have a ruptured ectopic, followed immediately by, you will survive this. And that is a word, that is a phrase that has not left my husband's mind in the years since then. Because it really hit home just how dangerous the situation was that the doctor even had to say that survival is an option, that I will survive. He kicked into high gear, my doctor. He rattled off a bunch of directions to my husband that essentially I gathered later on were that I have to go to the emergency room, that I'm going to have emergency surgery, that it was happening because my tube had ruptured. So the embryo that I was carrying had implanted in my left fallopian tube. And it had outgrown that space, and so the tube ruptured, and so all in my pelvis was full of blood. I was losing blood. I was bleeding internally, and that's why I was feeling so sick, and I was feeling so tired, and I was feeling so off. He went so far as to print out my entire history because it was... A little complicated, even at that point. He went to the OB department to find who was on call to do the surgery, brought her over, and had me meet her so that I could feel comfortable when I went into surgery with somebody who I didn't know because he wasn't able to do that surgery. Even in the midst of this medical crisis, he was so thoughtful about my patient experience, which is a whole other conversation I can have with you about what it takes to be a good doctor. Needless to say here, I would say he thought of everything. He went into crisis mode. He went into management mode. And he got all the medical things that were necessary. He rattled off my entire medical history to her in front of me so that I could correct anything that he missed. Even though by then I was slumped over in a wheelchair and just like... Not quite with it. But the thing was, you know, through all of this, I know they were terrified. My doctor was terrified. My husband was terrified for months after this. But when I really listened to my body, I knew that I was safe. I don't know how. I don't, I don't have anything concrete to tell you that that was the case or why I felt that way. But there was something inside of me that said, you're safe. You are not going to die today. I just knew it. There was, there was a confidence there. And so in a way, I was more relaxed than really anybody else that was around me at that time. My husband wheeled me to the lobby where he went to go get the car. And I had to make phone calls because I had things planned for that afternoon that needed to be canceled, including picking up a friend from the airport who was visiting me that weekend. And scheduling things and canceling things and then letting my mom know that, it, oh, by the way, I'm going to the hospital for emergency surgery. I made a couple of calls and I'll be honest with you, I don't remember exactly how those calls went, but I know I made them because I remember being amongst the other wheelchairs at the side of the lobby waiting for my husband. And then he ran in, put me in the car. And then he dropped me off at the ER while 
he went to go park the car. And because we had connected with the surgeon beforehand, she had also notified notified the OR that I was coming and there was going to be an emergency surgery. So it was all laid out for me perfectly. I just had to get my body to that place. And so I went into admissions. I had to sign some paperwork. And <laughs> there was a moment where I'm very particular about health records. And um, even before we started doing fertility treatment, I told my husband, we've got to get our advanced directives done because just in case, God forbid, something happens, we should have it in writing what we want for ourselves and our health care. And we had literally started doing it before Christmas and we then stopped because all of this was going on. And then I'm signing these papers in admissions. I'm I'm bleeding internally. I can barely hold a pen and I <laughs> slam the pen down as strongly as you can do it when you're bleeding internally. And I remember telling the lady, I knew we should have signed the advance directives and we don't have it and they're at home and I'm so sorry. <laughs> And I remember she's just looking at me. I'm like, you know, in my 20s and I'm she knows I'm in a really scary situation. She just looks at me and she goes, it's OK, sweetie, we'll be OK. <laughs> and my husband has not let me down, let, let this down since then. He's like, you're crazy. Like the thing, the places your brain goes when you your life is in danger and this is what you're spending your energy on getting mad at us for not doing the advanced directive. So, you know, that's really to say that I I wasn't I wasn't scared that I was going to lose my life that day. But nobody else knew that cuz they didn't they weren't in my body. And I'll say this too that if you heard my um story of when I first got pregnant, first found out, and I had ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, that felt scarier to me than a ruptured ectopic because I knew there was something very wrong in my body. I could feel it in my body that there was something more wrong than having a ruptured fallopian tube. So all, I mean, what I mean to say is your body knows you're, you know, and so we've got to calm the panic to really tap into that intuition to say, am I safe? Am I not? And I felt both of them and I know they feel very different. And I know that every time you're in a situation like that, it'll your body will tell you how scary and how dangerous it actually is. So I finished admissions. I go into the OR and they lie down and I finally feel better. Like, oh, I'm lying down. I don't have to sit. I don't have to stand. I don't have to walk. I don't have to really talk to anyone. My parents come in and they're both completely terrified. I mean, the fear is written all over their face. And because I'm feeling better by lying down, now I'm able to talk a little bit more. And so when the anesthesiologist comes in, he's joking with us about football because the Super Bowl was going to happen in a few weeks. We were talking about football. And I sat there and I talked to him and I asked him, hey, have you had dinner yet? Because I want to make sure that you are in a good place to keep me safe during <laughs> surgery. So we laughed about how I was asking everyone that came in, have you eaten dinner yet? Have you eaten dinner yet? I just want to make sure you guys aren't going to pass out from hunger in there. <laughs> uh, and I think that that humor helped calm everybody else down a little bit, especially my family, because they could see that I was feeling okay. I didn't look good. I was very pale because I had lost a lot of blood. But if I could make jokes like that, then it probably wasn't as serious as everybody's worried it would be. The surgery took, I think, like two, two and a half hours. And I don't really remember going home, you know, with anesthesia. It was outpatient. So I was in recovery for some time and then somehow I made it home. And that was, that was it. That day was the day that I lost my very first body part and I lost my very first baby. And it was such a whirlwind that it took a few days to wrap my head around what had just happened. And one of the best things that I think my surgeon had done is to talk to my husband while I was in recovery and tell him this is not going to hit her for a few days. 
give it like three, four days, and then it's going to hit her emotionally what just happened. She's not going to feel it right away. And she was spot on. My surgery was on a Tuesday. And it wasn't until Friday when I completely broke down. Crying because my body wasn't safe for this baby. And this baby had to go. It didn't survive. We lost it because of the surgery and because of my body almost tricking it to implant in a place that it didn't belong. The guilt of having endometriosis worse than we even thought it was. The heartbreak of losing this baby and knowing that there, we had imagined, we'd already started imagining a little person guessing and making jokes about what we thought he or she would look like or be like or who, which one of us they would be more like, which one of us would influence this person more, which, you know, what color, well, we knew what color hair they would have. It had to be black. But, you know, would it be curly or wavy or straight? Would they have dimples or not? Would they, you know, what would they grow up to be like? Those dreams start so early in your in your pregnancy and sometimes even before that and then to experience a loss and physically viscerally feel those dreams being taken away to experience the worst kind of heartbreak and know that wow In reality, this may never happen for us. And then you add on to that the trauma of, I could have died that day. It shook my husband to his core for many, many, many months. And through it all, Through it all, there was really one thing that stood out the absolute most that every single woman needs to know, which is that you don't need to know what's happening to your body, but you do need to speak up and get attention by sharing that something feels wrong so your doctor can figure out what it is. Because in the end, statistics don't matter. In the end... Your doctor's experience doesn't even matter. My doctor had been practicing as a reproductive endocrinologist, I want to say, for probably 15 years by that point. He's seen a lot of patients. And just because he had never seen it rupture at such a low HCG level doesn't mean it's not possible. And so it's so, so important that you speak up when something feels wrong. Don't feel bad about calling your doctor in the middle of the night. I actually ended up calling my doctor on Christmas Day. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, his wife and his children are going to kill me that I'm taking him away from their Christmas traditions, whatever they might be. You have to do it. Trust your body. Trust your body and do whatever it takes to get the attention that you need because your body will always tell you if something is wrong. The other thing that I want you to know is that when you're going through something like this, you have to know that healing takes time. Physically and emotionally, it takes time. It took me a solid four months to replenish all the blood that I had lost. And I don't actually, you know, I don't know that it had even been replenished by then. I think I just felt strong enough to try again with another fertility treatment cycle. But I think I was still weak at that point. My levels look good on blood work, but in my body I could tell I felt different. But emotionally... It can take even longer. It can take even longer. And having gone through a high-risk pregnancy myself and now working with women with high-risk pregnancies, I know that that grief can take a toll on your pregnancy health and even your fertility health going forward. So 
if you are experiencing pregnancy after loss, or if you are experiencing trying to heal after a loss, and you'd like help with coping with that and healing truly, please reach out at barijatdeshbande.com slash contact. And I'd love to share with you how I can help. There's so many questions when you are pregnant, especially when you're doing fertility treatment. There's a lot of fear about ectopic pregnancies. Rightfully so. They're dangerous. They are really, really dangerous. But better than telling you signs and symptoms of what to expect and what an ectopic feels like, because let's be honest, it feels different for everybody. It was not painful for me. I didn't have a lot of cramping except for that one moment in the lab. It wasn't painful. Other people, it's extremely painful and they have cramping all the time and they don't know what it means. So better than me listing out a bunch of symptoms for you to try to check off to see if it's right or wrong or if that's working for you, there's one thing that you need to know if you're su suspecting a ruptured ectopic, just one. You don't need to know what's happening to your body. But you do need to speak up when something feels wrong so your doctor can figure it out. Speak up loudly. Speak up often. I know that is the very reason why I survived that day. Because I got help early. I demanded to be seen even when the clinic was closed. And I know that you can do the same. Because that can make all the difference. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I know this was a heavy episode and it may be triggering for you. So please take it slow and take it easy. Give yourself the room, the space, the compassion to release the anxiety. If anything's been raised from you, release the trauma and the memories. If anything was triggered in you, reach out if you'd like some help to work through that. But know that there's hope, even with a ruptured ectopic, even with a loss, there is hope to heal physically and emotionally. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love it if you can head over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review so more and more women who are going through all of these experiences that we're not really talking about enough infertility, high-risk pregnancy, prematurity, loss of any kind, they can tune into Delivering Miracles for inspiration, tips, stories of hope on how to get through it all and how to heal from it when it's all over. I would also love to stay in touch. So follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Barijat Desh. That's P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H. Loss of any kind, no matter how early in your pregnancy, is devastating. Loss that threatens your life has an additional layer of trauma that you must work through to help yourself heal. And that goes for your partner too. Go slow and let your body guide you as you get the treatment you deserve and as you heal after it's all over. Take it one day, one step at a time. You can do this. <laughs>